Section 19 of The Spell of the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines by Isabel Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Spell of the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines by Isabel Anderson. Section 19, Chapter 9, The Moros, Part 2. We had two more hours of horseback riding. We hoped to see a boar hunt but owing to some misunderstanding, it did not come off. Then, after a stand-up luncheon at Major Brown's, we started down the trail again in a doherty. It was a beautiful drive through the forest on the island of Mindanao. We first crossed open grassy uplands, then dipped down through the great glades of the most tropical forest I have ever seen, with towering hardwoods and tree ferns, with bamboos and clinging air plants and orchids and there was mystery and wonder about the giant growths the trees seemed taller than the elms of new england or the cedars of oregon they dripped with huge-leaved clinging vines which grew higgledy piggledy covering everything the grass too with waving purple tassels grew higher than a man's head twice as high as the pygmy brown people who have their houses in these trees the tree dwellers just referred to are the manabos and the bagabos with pointed teeth for mindanao is not entirely inhabited by moros there are supposed to be no less than twenty-four tribes on this island alone they build in trees to escape the spear thrusts of their neighbors through the bamboo floors we were to make their acquaintance later a drenching rain came on that afternoon through which the escort jogged along while we clung in our doherties, nearly shaken to pieces, and reaching Malabang on the other side of the island, as much fatigued as if we had been on horseback all the way. The military post here was most attractive, with the prettiest of Nipa houses for the officers, and the parade lined with shading palms and flower-bordered walks. A charming station! We were quartered with Lieutenant Barry and his wife, a delightful young couple, in their thatched house, and dined with Major Sargent, the commanding officer, who has written some good books on military topics. The celibacy was calm and lovely when we left Malabang. We passed along the coast of Mindanao toward a long lowland that lay between the high mountains of the island. This was the plain of the Cotobato, a great river which overflows its banks annually, like the Nile, and has formed a fertile valley that could be turned to good account. The mouth of the river is shallow, so that we were transferred to a stern-wheel boat that was waiting, and began to work our way up, against the rapid current, past low, uninteresting banks that were proving rather monotonous, when suddenly we turned a point and saw the town of Cotobato, the moros and the other tribes were in their full splendor here soon down this tropical river where crocodiles dozed and monkeys chattered and parakeets shrieked there came a flotilla from the arabian nights manned by galley slaves on the masts and poles of one of the barges floated banners and under the canopy of green sat a real princess some of the boats were only dugouts with outriggers but they were decorated too and all the tribes were dressed in silks and velvets of the brightest colors there was great excitement and much cheering as we approached the landing stage and the troops stood at attention while the rest of the shore was alive with a throng of natives in all the colors of the rainbow the secretary inspected the troops and we saw for the first time the moro constabulary wearing turbans and sashes but with bare legs Nevertheless, they looked very dashing. Indeed, the Moros were so different in character and appearance from any people we had seen before that they might as well have come down from the stars. The secretary was taken to meet the Datos, as they stood in line beneath the great trees, with the motley crowds of retainers behind them, in such a medley of colors as I had never imagined before. The sunlight filtered through the trees upon the barbaric costumes, while the gaily dressed women stood behind the men and peered over them. The brown men looked dignified and very self-respecting, too, although the scene was like the setting of a comic opera, where the imagination had been allowed to run riot. There we saw Dato Piang and Gimbunjin, a very fat Dato. What a delightful bugaboo name! also Gnak, whose ear had been cut off in a fight, 
we were told, but strange as it may seem, he said he had clapped it onto his face again and tied it on, and it had grown there. So it hung attached somewhere down on his cheek, and gave him a very peculiar appearance. When the Moros conquered the Filipinos, this Dado had the captured women stripped and made to walk before him, and then took them off to the mountains when he was taken prisoner later by the filipinos he was compelled to work in chains in the streets under a canopy the princess received us a native woman whose descent was traced for many hundreds of years said to be a pure moro although she looked rather chinese and who was recognized as of the highest social superiority but had little political power she herself was draped in varied colors while her chamberlain wore a brocade coat of crimson and gold cloth behind her stood her maids bearing the gold beetle nut boxes and chow trays and umbrellas of her rank our luncheon with the commanding officer major heiberg and his wife was eaten in delightful little kiosks of nipa and bamboo which had been built in a small palm grove the dancing girls of the princess who had long nails protected by silver covers gave us a performance afterward curiously enough their dance was very japanese in character then some manobos picturesque in short skin-tight trousers and bolero jackets with bags and boxes beautifully worked in bright beads danced a graceful monotonous step the women have a swaying snake-like dance with waving arms and jingling of bracelets and hiplets if i may be allowed to coin the word at last after so many adventures we found ourselves again on board the rizal an enchanting spot on this boat was a projection over the bow on which one could sit curled up high above the water on this perch we felt like the red-winged seagulls that circled far above us we passed over a sea of polished jade which at night shone with phosphorescence like gleaming silver next morning august twenty third we approached zamboanga five american ships all decorated came steaming out to meet us and fell in behind in order making a lovely sight on the bright smooth seas as we neared the town we suddenly saw a large flotilla of native boats with tom-toms beating and thousands of flags fluttering such a gay sight banners of all shapes streaming and flapping and waving and such colors and combinations of colors stripes of green and purple and orange in designs of lemon and red and magenta serpentine flags and square ones hung in all sorts of ways and brightly colored canopies under which sat the sultans and green umbrellas and yellow and bang off went their small latankas tiny native made cannon a most exciting reception we landed under triumphal arches and were driven in state carriages through lines of schoolchildren who sang and threw us flowers from old spanish gardens the post was really beautiful for it had much left from old spanish times and what had been done over had been done with taste the green parade had a terraced canal passing through it and avenues of palm the officers quarters smothered in flowering plants and fronting out over the glittering blue sea were large and airy and finer than any we had seen before it is considered one of the best posts in the philippines and seemed cool and pleasant there was the usual procession first the troops of the garrison and the constabulary then thousands of visiting moros bagobos and manobos of every color of skin and clothes, many of them whooping and leaping, and then a tiresome following of hundreds of Filipinos who had joined in to make a political demonstration. It is said the Filipinos did not wish the Moros to take part in the procession. Exciting times followed at the meeting after this parade, where both Filipino and Moro speakers were heard. Said a Filipino, addressing the secretary, you have just visited our province and have just learned its conditions at such places in it through which you have passed you must have seen quite a number of moros but i believe that a separation could very well be established to the end that both people the christian filipino and the filipino moro might have the government that corresponds respectively to each of them for it is a very regrettable thing that on account of the presence of the latter we christians should be unable to enjoy the liberties that reason and right would grant us 
I think it is my duty to advise you that the Moros who filed past the grandstand were brought from remote and distant places with the exclusive purpose of giving greater eclat to your reception. Moreover, it must be borne in mind always, in dealing with the affairs of this province, that the Moros have no political influence, possess no property, nor help pay the expense of the government. Then Dato Mandi spoke. I am here, El Raja Muro Mandi, representing the Moros. As I look about, I see far more Moros than the Filipino contingent, and if that is so, that is the reason it is called the Moro province. Tremendous applause from the Moros. When first the Americans came here, from the very beginning, whatever they asked me to do, I did. I was loyal to them ever. Now I have heard a rumor that we Moros were in the hands of the Filipinos. If the American government does not want the Moro province any more, they should give it back to us. It is a Moro province. It belongs to us. Tremendous applause by the Moros. Dato Sakaluran threw down the Moro challenge. I am an old man. I do not want any more trouble. But if it should come to that, that we shall be given over to the Filipinos, I still would fight. Applause. But Haji Nangnui, who spoke of himself as a Samal, made the clearest statement of the moral position. The Secretary of War must look the matter in the face. We are a different race. We have a different religion. We are Mohammedans. And if we should be given over to the Filipinos, how much more would they treat us badly? than they treated even the Spanish badly, who were their own mothers and their own fathers in generations. How do they treat them? Think about it. Think twice. We far prefer to be in the hands of the Americans, who are father and mother to us now, than to be turned over to another people. Applause. In the evening we dined delightfully at the Pershings. After dinner the Moros danced in the garden the spear and shield dance, and the Bagabo women gave the scarf dance. The Bagabos still offer human sacrifices. Their caps, if tied in a certain way, show how many men they have killed. Their dress is made of cloth which they weave from carefully selected and dyed fibers of manila hemp, and it is treated with wax in such a way as to make it very smooth and durable. In the glow of the red light from Chino Charlie's famous lanterns, their picturesque costumes, gleaming with beadworks, added much to the brilliancy of the scene. They love music and make some large stringed instruments. They also play the flute from the nose, with one nostril stopped up, like the Hawaiians. The dancing under the palms in the garden, by the rippling seas, where the moonlight flooded down radiantly, was quite like a strange dream. At this dinner, I was told the story given by Dean Worcester, by which the Moros explain why they do not eat pork. Mahamud had a grandson and a granddaughter. As he was king of the world, Christ came to his house to visit him. Mahamud, jealous of him, told him to prove his power by dividing what he had in a certain room, where, in fact, were his grandchildren. Christ replied that he had no wish to prove his power and would not divine. Mahomud then vowed that if he did not answer correctly, he should pay for it with his life. Christ responded, You have two animals in there, different from anything else in the world. Mahomud replied, No, you are wrong, and I will now kill you. Christ said, Look first and see for yourself. Mahomud opened the door and out rushed two hogs into which Christ had changed his grandchildren. Some verses recited at General Pershing's dinner show the feeling of army officers about their life in the Philippines. A stanza runs, What is it makes us fret so hard in this benighted land? It isn't lack of courage, and it isn't lack of sand. It isn't fear of moros or bagobos from the hills. It's the many great discomforts and the many, many ills. It is interesting to read in a recent number of the Manila Times that Zamboanga, which seemed so like a picture handed down from Spanish days, had absorbed a good share of American progressiveness, and is said to stand in a class by itself among Philippine towns. Waterworks and a hydroelectric plant are under construction, the water for which is to be brought along the mountainside, a part of the way through tunnels. To dig these, experienced Igorot tunnel-makers from Benguet were imported. 
who are getting along amicably with the Moros. At Jolo or Sulu we were again greeted by a Moro fleet and some diving girls and boys. This seemed the culmination of the picturesque in our trip. The mountains of the islands are not high, but rather cone-shaped, and as we approached the town we could see behind it the forested slopes of steep Badajo, where the great fight took place in 1906, and many Moros were killed in the crater-top of the volcano to which they had retreated, and from which they challenged and threatened the American forces. It is an island of fierce, piratical Moros, and even the Americans had not tried to do much there. It was dangerous to go outside the little walled town at all, and all the natives coming in were searched for their weapons, which were taken away at the gates. Only a few months before, a fanatic Moro tried to attack the gate guard, but fortunately was killed before fatally injuring anyone. The walled town is a most artistic little Spanish place, built once upon a time by the exiled Spanish governor Asturia, who made it a gem of a town with small balustrated plazas and a hanging garden seawall and a miniature wall with battlements and gates and streets set out with shading trees the pretty officers club and quarters overhung the wall the gates of the town are closed at night and all the natives must leave for their houses outside before the retreat but there is a native market and a town built out on piles over the water which we visited we drove out to a plain palm-fringed and backed by mountains that overlooked the sea, where there was a review of the cavalry and a large company of mounted Moros, who carried many American flags among their waving banners. Within the walls, in a grandstand in the little plaza, where the natives thronged, there was a meeting between the secretary and the chief Datos, and the haji, who had been vizier of the sultan, made a wise speech, full of promise, of loyalty. Our governor had won the good will of the people about him, and the haji said that when his people were certain of our good intentions, they would come in willingly and be loyal. But, for so many years, they had been misled by previous rulers. We amused ourselves by going to Chino Charlie's and buying lanterns, and lunched at the officers' club. Afterward, we went out on the pier inhabited by the Chinese and looked for pearls, jolo pearls are famous but we saw none of real value we watched the chinamen drying copra and went through their market where water slugs were for sale finally we sailed across the bay our visit to the moros was full of color to the end for the sun was setting gorgeously as we put out to sea end of section nineteen recording by william tomko Section 20 of The Spell of the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines by Isabel Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Spell of the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines by Isabel Anderson. Section 20, Chapter 10, Journey's End. The little coral island of Bancoran lies in the middle of the Sulu Sea quite outside the usual routes of travel. It is inhabited only by birds, and people seldom or never go there. But we wanted to obtain, if we could, some new species of gulls or terns for the Bureau of Science at Manila, and also to enjoy the mysterious sea gardens which are found among the southern reefs. Just after Tiffin, the island was sighted, lying quite alone by itself in milky green water. The ship stopped and launches were dropped overboard and a glass-bottomed boat which had been brought along for our use. The afternoon was ideal. The sky blue and fleeced with snowy clouds piled high, while the intense sun shining on the water flashed back a hundred shades of blue and green and mauve. On one side of the island, which floated like an emerald among sapphires, outstanding rocks chafed the sea into foaming surf while on the other a long narrow beach lay shimmering, pale yellow in the sunlight. The island itself was covered with a thick jungle of trees, which were dotted with thousands of resting birds. As we drew nearer, they saw us, and were afraid, rising and soaring and circling in the clear, pure air, and crying out at us. Flock after flock of sea-fowl flew wonderingly over our small craft, their white breasts tinted green with the light reflected from the water. 
It was like a Robinson Crusoe island, lost out there in the lonely sea. But there were shells of huge turtles and bones of birds, which suggested that sometime a feast must have been held there, so it was not wholly undiscovered and unexplored. Among the great roots of the trees the birds had built their nests from leaves. The eggs in some of them were white and about the size of hen's eggs. Several varieties of boobies and terns were found, some brown with green-blue eyes, others ivory-white. A few specimens were shot, and one or two were taken back alive to the Rizal for the museum. Previous to this visit, the ornithologists had never known to what islands the boobies and frigate birds came to nest, although the scientists had long been searching for the place, so the expedition was well worth while. But the sea gardens interested me more than the birds, or even the island. If Alice could have had her choice in entering Wonderland, she would surely have selected a doorway leading through a glass-bottomed boat, instead of dropping down a rabbit's hole. Beneath the water, which was crystal clear, we could see a strange country with new flowers and peculiar creatures. Where it was sandy and shallow, we saw below us fields of green sea grass, on which the fairies must surely have used lawn mowers. It was so neatly kept. Interspersed among the fields were beds of feathery, lace-like vegetation, unnamed in the language of our party. Passing one expanse after another of this submarine pasturage, we saw depressions in the coral, where tiny fishes played, or unknown water creatures had established a little world for themselves, and were lying in its narrow confines, quite unconscious of what went on in the surrounding vastness. Drifting on into deeper water, we came to a ghost-like gray world of curls and feathers, trembling with life, a forest of pale trees and swaying brown ones, of high hills and dark valleys, made of coral reefs. Pretty rock gardens came into view, where there were cabbages with blue edges, sea anemones, and purple fans, a huge toadstool, a giant fungus, and a cactus plant, at least that is what they looked like to us. There were rainbow shells, too, half-hidden, and great blue starfish clinging to the rocks. In and out among the sponges and the brown coral branches, which were so much like antlers, swam curious fishes. Such gorgeous colors, so vivid and in such brilliant combinations. Some were big green fellows with needle noses, others were electric blue and silver. There were black and yellow ones, too and striped fishes that looked like sly prisoners dodging their keepers. We passed the greater part of the afternoon marooned on this faraway island, some of us going bathing off the shallow, sandy beaches in the clear water. As evening came on, we regretfully left the fairy island of Bancoran and sailed away by the rising moon. The penal colony on Palawan, which I have described in another chapter, was our next point of interest. We left there behind schedule, and met a stronger current than we had expected, sweeping down the coast of Panay, so that it was no wonder that we were late in approaching Iloilo. This was especially unfortunate, for very generous preparations had been made there for the Secretary's reception, and an interesting series of events arranged, all of which was upset by the delay. It was sunset when we finally sighted the town. As we cruised up the steeply palisaded coast, with the low-lying foreground of Panay on the other side, backed by its fine ranges of mountains, the effects were most beautiful. The old Spanish fort on its point looked mysterious in the afterglow, and the skies were magnificently alight. A fleet of much beflagged launches and steamers came out to meet the secretary, whistling a welcome, and turning, escorted the Rizal. Next to Manila, Iloilo is the most important port in the islands, and has a better climate than its rival. The people here are supposed to be wealthier and more aristocratic than elsewhere. The pain bill, which had been in operation only a short time, had brought such a return of prosperity to the land, and especially to the planters of this fertile province, that they were all very enthusiastic about Americans, and did all they could to express their gratitude. We were invited for dinner at half after seven, but it was an hour later before we sat down to the long table in the large and rather empty room with its handsome Venetian mirrors at either end, and its sliding shutters wide open to the night. There were no ladies present except those of our party, 
We could never tell how things would be arranged. Sometimes there would be Filipina ladies, and sometimes there would not. Sometimes the ladies would all be placed together at one side of the table, and again they would be seated next to the men. While waiting for dinner to be announced, we sat about in an airy room with half-dressed servants peeping in at us, and a phonograph playing Caruso records. After dinner, we had a long drive out through the town, which seemed quite businesslike and prosperous. They had rebuilt some of the fine, large, wide-open houses, most of which had been destroyed by the insurrectos. On the nearby island of Negros, we were told there were many fine haciendas with great houses full of carved work, which I was sorry not to see. Passing through suburbs of Nipa houses, standing up on their stilts in the moonlight, we came to a plaza gaily illuminated, and to our destination a mansion approached by a triumphal arch. In the best houses, the living rooms are on the second floor, just as in the poorer ones they are raised above the ground on stilts. So here we went upstairs to a great room hung with festoons of flags, where the little women in their bright and varied dresses, passing and repassing, made a gay scene. It was here, indeed, that we saw some of the prettiest and best-dressed women whom we met on our trip. Most of the following day was spent cruising along the coast of Panay, passing between its fine outlying islands, which reminded us of the inland sea of Japan. In the afternoon, we came to the entrance of the river on which Capiz is located. The secretary crossed overland on the first train to run on the new railway in order to drive in the silver spikes that completed the line. No dinners had been planned there for those of us who had come by ship, so we did not start up river until half after eight. Capiz is only four miles from the mouth, but they were the longest miles we had ever experienced, for by some mistake the pilot did not arrive, so we went in a Rizal launch without one. We just struggled along as well as we could in the dark till the moon came up, which only mystified us the more with its deceptive shadows. Half a dozen times we ran deep into mud banks, and the sailor men were forced to jump overboard and shove us off. They did not appear to enjoy doing this. And no wonder, for it was a crocodile river. Swarms of fireflies, which gathered on favorite trees, made a very Christmas-like effect with their throbbing lights. They were lovely, too, in the dark shore shadows, and made sparkling reflections in the Black River stream. Watching them, we could almost forget our troubles. Finally, after much winding round and backing off, we turned a bend and saw a line of little twinkling lights strung along the shore and on floating barges, giving quite a Venetian effect and showing us the town by their reflection. Landing, we walked across the grassy square in the provincial building, with its open courtyards where there was to be a ball. We danced a rigodon as usual and stopped late with the governor-general, who liked to show his interest in these functions of which the Filipinos think so much. There were three bands which vied with each other for applause. Next morning we got away early on our last leg for Manila and the end of our never-to-be-forgotten journey in the land of pine and palm, that far away, unfamiliar country where your head gets full of strange thoughts, your body of queer feelings, and your heart has great longings. We crowded everything we could into those few last days in Manila, for we were loath to think of leaving anything undone. Besides packing and shopping, there were teas and dinners, and the army and navy reception. This was lovely, for it was held in the courtyard, filled with trees which were hung with dim lanterns. The good-looking officers, with their white duck uniforms and brass buttons, added to the attractiveness of the scene. The men of our party were even busier than we, for they had several banquets to which we were not invited. In my husband's journal, I find the chronicle of a typical day. After describing the events of a busy morning, he says, In the afternoon there was a reception to meet the constabulary at four, the opening of the new hospital, a most complete and wonderful one, at half after four the laying of the cornerstone at five for the new hotel which is a very ambitious project and will make all the difference in the world as far as touring in the philippines is concerned in the evening a dinner and after that a reception and a dance manila seemed more picturesque and to have even more atmosphere as i came to know it better 
the old walls and churches and plazas and corners and quarters, the Pasig with its cascos and bancas plying about, the narrow streets winding through the suburbs with old moss-covered walls, and peeps of tangled gardens within, and balustrated terraces, and the bowers of the pink-blossoming chain of love. It is indeed well named the Pearl of the Orient. End of section twenty. Recording by William Tomko. End of the Spell of the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines by Isabel Anderson.